Hi, my name is John Messina, and welcome to another edition of Hey Coach. With me today is a good friend of mine, Rob Murphy, former Major League pitcher, pitched for eight different teams, especially the Red Sox now that we're right in the middle of the playoffs, but, but welcome, Rob. Thanks, John. For, have you, appreciate you having me back. Oh, I love to have you here. Uh, before we get started, I just want to put out a little bit of condolences, or a lot of condolences, to the family and friends of Al Kelly. Anybody who worked for Centennial, or, or not just Centennial, but high school sports in St. Lucie County knew Al. He was a football coach. He was a track coach at Centennial for over 20 years. He passed away a few weeks ago. Um, there wasn't a person that I knew that didn't love Al. I mean, he ran our games at Centennial. He was one of my closest friends, and he was just a, 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 a that's the way a coach should act. And, and Al was so big on sportsmanship and everything, and a lot of us are going to miss him. And uh, I know they had a little ceremony over at Centennial Forum during the football game, but uh, Al was a treasure. And, and somebody that I know a lot of the players who have now grown up really look up to him. So we'll miss Al. Well, Rob, right in the middle of the playoffs here, and I know you have a lot of Red Sox, Yankee stories. <laughs> Right? For sure. Okay. You know, the pure hatred between the organizations. And, and it is that. And, and unless you're from New York or Boston, you don't really realize that. You know, the first time I ever got a taste of a real rivalry was when I was in college at yeah. University of Florida. Right. And having grown up in Miami, you know, University of Miami right. was, was a big thing. But you get up in the northern part of the state of Florida, right. and you're on campus in Gainesville, and, and the letters FSU come yeah. out. And somebody's uh, speech, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's the, the pure enemy. Yeah. And, and I never really felt that again until the Yankee Red Sox. And, and the nation doesn't really understand that. It's New York and Boston that understands it. You know, uh, about two weeks ago, I was getting these texts from a lot of my former AD friends and a lot of coaches I knew and hanging there and I hope you're okay and tomorrow's another day. And I just gotten out of the hospital with surgery. So I thought, geez, these guys are really nice. They're thinking yeah. about me. Then I realized they're talking. That was the day the Yankees got beat by the Red Sox 16 to 1. So they forgot about me having the surgery. <laughs> they just wanted to make sure it was okay. But I remember years ago, way back when, going to Yankee Stadium and sitting in right field. And I felt bad for the right fielder for the Red Sox, <laughs> you know. But, um, you know, one of the things, and, and, you know, we're right in the middle of the baseball playoffs right now. Boy, have times changed. I mean, relief pitchers starting, going one batter. You had, uh, what did we have yet last night? We had multiple, uh, multiple players playing multiple positions and catchers that can't catch. Is, is that <laughs> yeah. another thing? I mean, times have changed. Huh? It really has. And it, it's, you know, it's something that I see that these field managers and front offices are trying to maximize every single angle for that projected 27 outs and and it's it seems like it's gotten to a point where as as a fan watching on TV it seems like it, it's almost swung to being too much why do you think that happened I mean you know why do you think all of a sudden there's these changes we went all these years without these changes and now it's coming I think when you look at an organization like the Florida Marlins the Miami Marlins right. and with a recent uh, change in ownership at uh, somewhere north of a billion dollars. Wow. When, when you own a club like this, you've got to really put some quality control onto what's happening at each level. And down on the playing field, that's where a lot of things aren't in your control because you know, you've got competitors on the field trying to uh, beat you, you know, right. in, in those nine innings. And sometimes you hang a slider when you're trying right. to throw one in the dirt. So. So a lot of the decisions and things are trying, I think they're trying to be taken away from the field managers and put into an orchestrated game plan and where it's like, do this in the first inning, do this in the second inning, and now, we see, you know, like say, you see it from your living room or bedroom, it's like, huh, I wonder why they're doing that. But everything's analytics now. I mean, when they were doing probabilities, if you're going to catch the ball or not, you know, I, I think it's just gone a little bit too far. You know, that's I mean, way too far. That's There's way no... too How do you know the wind, 
the lights, you know, did you get a bad jump or whatever, you know, it's, it's just a little bit too far on that. But I mean, you know, the one thing that you and I always talk about when we're coaching at Martin County is the amount of strikeouts now in the major leagues. It's, it's, it, it's something to see. Almost every pitcher has yeah. more than nine strikeouts per nine innings. Right. And back in the day, even my day, yeah. if you were close to nine per inning, you were a strikeout right. pitcher. And it makes me think, if I could put myself in, in today's yeah. environment, how many strikeouts you would get because these guys just seem to be swinging for the fences and that's that's one of the new things now is try to get the uh, launch angle up so you hit the ball in the air and right. I always remember guys like Wade Boggs trying to hit the ball down, on a line drive down. and down on the ground. Charlie Lau, right? Absolutely. Charlie, Charlie Lau yes. teaching that way and I, I, I think this was the first year in the history of baseball there was more strikeouts than hits. In April and, they announced that it's the first month Not ever ever and it continued through the whole season that's, that's a, a titanic that's switch here right now both of us as high school coaches and you do a fantastic job coaching at jensen beach and now over at martin county one of the most important things and i think for a lot of the parents out there is your arm protection with the young men okay I, everything uh, i wonder what the stats are how many pitchers have Tommy John surgery how many pitchers go on the disable list each year do you think it's a lot more now than when you played well first off I mean Tommy John if you look at the history of baseball I mean he pitched in the 70s that surgery was done in the 70s I believe so Correct. so we're still only 40 some years away from right. it but I read a statistic two years ago like literally you know the first weekend of October where 25% of the pitchers on major league rosters had had Tommy John surgery wow. at some point. That's way too much. Yeah. That's way too much. And, you know, when I think about how recent it was, I mean, every time I see Brent Strom, the Astros pitching coach, walk out on the mound, mm. I'll turn to whoever I'm sitting watching yeah. the game with. I said, do you know what he's famous for? And they're like, what? I said, he had the second Tommy John surgery. He had the second Tommy. So yeah. it could have been Brett Strong. Yes, exactly. That could have been his name on. So w what do you think? What are some of the things that, that parents and, and coaches, and, and, you know, you and I talk all the time. I'm very, very big on coaches being taught to coach, okay? You just don't, I'm a coach, okay? Correct. You have, just like teachers have to improve every year, coaches have to improve every year okay so what are some of the things that that, that young men and, and young coaches going into the year what can they do to protect their pitchers pitching pitching on the mound game day is one thing your preparation going into it physical and mental preparation is critical and then coming out of a pitching performance whether it's one inning or 17 complete game in okay. high school it's different and I know the first year coaching at Jensen, I put together a weekly pitching throwing plan right. based on what I learned in professional baseball. And that was too much because that's based on a five-day calendar for the starting right. pitchers. But in high school, these kids are really on a seven-day calendar. Right, you, you know, go on once a week. Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, third, right. or Friday, right. and your, you know, your district game's on Friday, and oftentimes that's the same pitcher. Right. So it gives you an extra day right after and it gives you an extra day before the next start. And immediately I saw kids, uh, let's say recovery time, uh, just improve between the start, the bullpen, the next start. And I think as a coach, writing things down, it helps you be able to refer back to how many days this kid has for rest, how many days until he pitches again. And when you see good performance coming again and again, what's the pattern? And if you have, I mean, at any given time, we have 20 pitchers doing bullpens and pitching in games. You're not gonna just remember off the top of your head right. how much rest, how much till we go forward. If you write it down, it's gonna help you be a better coach. And, and also, I, I know as when I was coaching and when I was an athletic director, one of the most important things for me was that they would not, and I'm gonna emphasize the word not, play baseball or pitch year-round. Play other sports, M be multi-sports, because I know when we had Rick Ankiel on the show, you know, Rick emphasized, hey, if you're using the same muscles over and over again, sooner or later something's gonna happen. I grew up in Miami, 
Okay. Great baseball weather, 12 yes. months a year. Right. And as a kid, I played baseball from January to April. Right. And that was it. Uh, maybe we were throwing pine cones at each other yeah. in the yard uh, yeah. in the summertime, things like that. But yeah. baseball was literally just a third of the year. In high school, that season extends because of high school playoffs and right. then maybe American Legion. But then when Legion ball was right. over, baseball was over. And I think that's a big difference with the kids nowadays. There's not real recovery with enough of a time off where all of a sudden you're bigger and stronger the next time you pick up the ball two months from now as opposed to three days from now. See, you, you can't tell a travel ball coach, don't pitch this kid, okay? Because they're on their own agenda. I mean, you can say it, but they can't do high school. They can't do summer ball. They can't do fall ball. They need a time to be kids. They also need a time to, I'd love them to play multi-sports. I mean, when I first started at Centennial, um, we used to have so many young men and women that played three or more sports. I mean, four sports, two at the same time, mm -hmm. sometime. When I left, 20 years later, there was very few that played even two sports because people want to specialize. Now, why do you think that is with the parents? <sighs> That's the way parents are. Uh, sitting in the stands watching my daughter pitch yeah. uh, her softball teams when you would sit and listen to the other parents they yeah. they had this perspective that it's season is 12 months a year okay. and besides the player in the uniform you got to remember the kid out of the uniform and, and you just said it kids have to be kids and there yeah. needs to be this downtime and it's like after a game a kid has made an error that cost their team the game the last thing to do is talk to them about that because yeah. they know they blew it. Right. And it, my polling yeah. amongst young athletes, I ask them what the least favorite part of your sport is, and they'll say the ride home after a game. So <laughs> it's a great it, it, line. It's tough. And and I know the major leagues, and also well, starting with the little leagues, have really emphasized the pitch count. Now the way baseball is going now with the relievers coming in you know it, I don't think a pitch counts ever going to be in effect and usually things trickle down you're going to see this in college now eventually you're going to see this in high school okay where your reliever and you know sometimes unless you have a kind of an elite program you don't have that top-notch reliever but people are thinking about hey let's start this guy for two innings then we bring our starter in and then we're done but uh, do you see what they're doing in Major League trickling down to college first? Everything trickles downhill. It right. definitely will right. happen. Right. And I think about the fact that there were never pitch counts. And never. now, now right. they've evolved. Right. And now they're, they're being brought to such a finite point. Like you said, it's just about you know, this reliever, that reliever. Now, I heard an expression this postseason that I've never heard before. Pardon my ignorance, but coaches talk about pitching lanes where you're going to pitch to a certain part of the order. Certain pitchers are safe or a certain part of the order. Uh, I've never heard of that, so that's a new uh, one. I've got to do a little research on that. But, but mentioning pitch count, and like you said, they, they never counted in never. the 50s. I mean, everybody, there were so many complete games. There's the famous game between the Milwaukee Braves and the San Francisco Giants. I think it was in the early 60s. Went 15 innings, Juan Marichal and Warren Spahn, and the, both of them pitched complete games. I think the total amount of pitches was close to 500. Wow. Didn't bother those guys. They're both in the Hall of Fame, you know? Right. It's, it's just, but again, and again, you would know this better than most people. When you were a major leaguer, when you were in your off season, did you throw the ball? I was uh, maybe in a little bit different of a program because yeah. I had was a heavy use relief pitcher. Right. So let's say a team was done by the end of September. Okay. I wouldn't want to go from six days a week throwing to zero that next week. Okay. So in October, I would throw four times the first week, three times the second, twice the third week, once the fourth week. And then I'd take about six weeks off, no throwing, okay. and gear it back up slowly so that you know, when you got to spring training, you were really ready. It wasn't a matter of, okay, now I have to get in shape. And that, that was the beginning of the training change, right. too, with uh, professional athletes. Right. Now, the, the high school association, the FHSAA, about three years ago, they put in a pitch count. 
The problem was it wasn't really enforced during the season. Okay, they left it up to the coaches. Mm -hmm. Now, the coaches are going to look at each other and say, hey, we're not going to follow this or whatever. And then they said, can the umpires do this? Well, the umpires wanted no part of this. But the last two years, when they got to the state tournament, the state, which actually runs the tournament, it was over in Fort Myers last year, it was at um, the Met Stadium a few years before that, and the FHSA really governs it. Okay, they actually pulled pitchers in the middle of innings because they hit the pitch count, and a lot of these coaches were, were shocked, and it ended up costing some teams the state championship. I mean, how, how strong do you believe in the pitch count? I think the lead-up and the preparation into a, a game is more important than the pitch count during the game. Okay, can you and explain you that a little more, so, the lead-up? So, you know, it's, it's about, you know, it's, it's exercise and rest, exercise and rest. Right. So if, if the pitcher pitched on a Friday evening, so you get sat, high school pitcher, and Saturday and Sunday's off, so Monday's a light bullpen, Tuesday's very little throwing, Wednesday, some long toss to just sort of stretch right. things out, Thursday's off again, Friday back on the mound. You're ready for 100 pitches, 100-plus pitches, no doubt about it, once, once you've built that foundation. And so to... On a Friday night, say, all right, you know, you're in the sixth inning and you've, you've, uh, you've gone over 100 pitches. You can keep going because you're going to have two days of rest. And then that next bullpen on that Monday, so instead of being 40 pitches, maybe it's 30 pitches. And that long toss will be lighter. And it's, just, it's, it's about managing it, just sort of you know, holding the reins and letting loose and pulling, pulling a little tighter. So the actual number of pitches... I think you could go to 140 pitches if, if all things considered and if you see the pitcher still performing. If they're getting tired, obviously the risk of uh, injury uh, runs a little higher. But you, you observe, use your eyes as opposed to looking down at a counter saying, oh, what, that's 101, but better get something changed. Now, you have seen the Little League World Series, which has been very popularized in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, they not only, years ago they would show just the final game at Williamsport. Now you're seeing all the regionals all the way through. Now these young men and young women in some cases 12 years old and under. How about the amount of breaking balls that they're throwing? I mean I saw a game this year uh, it was one of the teams in the southern regional. Kid got on the mound through 12 straight breaking pitches at 12 years old. What do, what do you think about that? I think throwing a breaking ball properly really keeps the risk at a very low level. Okay. But but trying to spin a ball from behind your ear and try to make it break eight feet right. as it travels 46 feet forward in Little League, I think that's wrong. And I think it's about the main issue is doing it improperly. And But, but you wouldn't, Major League pitchers don't throw 12 breaking balls no. in a row. So why should a 12-year-old? I, I know I was I was shaving before I got to throw a breaking right. ball as a kid, and, and actually I had my uh, learner's permit too. So I was 15 before right. my dad let me throw a breaking ball. But there we go back to the point where we need education as coaches, okay? I mean, who's really teaching you this? I wish there was a way that Major League would trickle down to the minor leagues, would trickle down to the colleges, where they had people go around doing clinics and showing people how to do it. And it only benefit them. I mean, I mean, you know, we both come from an area in Miami where baseball is king. And I know you went to Columbus High School, which has a great, great tra tradition of baseball. And we were just talking about Eduardo Perez, who, who was one of the announcers on the playoffs, played at Columbus and, and many other players. But I wish there was a way where, you know, you have these guys like Eduardo Perez, like yourself, you know, go down and do clinics and show coaches the right way. I mean, when, when I was coaching in high school, everybody called me a thief. And the reason was, I wanted to go to these clinics and say, hey, what are you doing? Let me take that plan. And then I'd sit next to a coach and, how are you doing this drill? And let me see how you're doing. I, I think a lot of times our younger coaches don't want to learn. Don't want to learn as much, okay? You don't know it all. I mean, I was at a coach in, you know, all the years I was AD, and when I went back and helped at Martin County this year, Things have changed. <laughs> you know, I, I, I yes. think well, one of the things, the biggest thing, is the kids want to know when you ask them to do something, you want to know why. 
so my, my answer to that was, okay, I want you to do this, and then I want you to tell me why you're doing it. So you tell me why you're doing it. If they can repeat it back to you, that means they've really heard you. They, they and that's can repeat important. it back to you. But, but, you know, like I said, the, the whole game has changed. Um, let's talk about when we were down in Miami. We had some really good times. I remember I was over your house this summer, and you were showing me a picture where you were pitching against Pace. And I'm saying, wait a minute, I'm coaching first base, and you're pitching, you know? Yeah. But um, tell me a little bit about your experience at Columbus High School down in Miami. Columbus had a really good tradition back then, even though the school wasn't even 20 years old at that right. point. You know, the baseball was very important at right. Columbus. And yeah. the fact that you had a varsity and two JV teams and a freshman, and freshman team, there, team. Were a, there was a lot of attention yeah. given to the baseball yeah. program. And you know, I can remember the bell ringing on a certain day in January and having to run down to the gymnasium to see if I had made the list <laughs> of uh, the they put the list out, they put right? it down, down yeah, in the locker room. Yeah. I can remember running right. down and, and, and the guys that were around me and, yeah. and you know, some people were happy, some people were sad seeing right. that list. And it, it was the first time, you know, had ever been in a situation where somebody could get cut. And it was, it was, it was a little eye-opening. Right. realized, boy, right. some friends didn't make it. Yeah. And, but then you got to go out there, and it was a battle. I mean, there were so many good teams in yeah. the area. And then you, you go to a, a few parks that you've never been to. I think uh, Grapeland Park, we went to play a game my freshman year. And wow, there was, I mean, the crowd was intense. Yeah. And, you know, we're 14, 15 years old, yeah. and it was like it was the World Series, uh, you know, in the middle of January yeah. in Miami. Yeah, I remember playing down there. And I guess when, when I was coaching down there in the 80s and stuff, there was maybe... 30 schools that, that had baseball programs. Now there's probably 70. And, and I mean, the, the talent was just second to none down there and everything. So after you graduated from Columbus, you went to University of Florida. Did you have any other choices or anything? Yeah, one of my last decisions I had to make was to not go to the University of Miami. You know, my dad had uh, built a friendship with Coach Fraser, Ron yeah, Fraser. Right. And I just didn't want to go to school five minutes from home. Okay. If I'd have lived in Fort Lauderdale, okay. I would have gone to the University yeah. of Miami. But uh, the pitching coach at UF, uh, Steve Weber, had a good reputation, and that's part of why I went there. And then yeah. after, well, Steve actually left after my sophomore year, went to the University of Georgia, and they won the College World Series, right. and he became a professional coach and scout for 40 years. So wow. he was a real right. pitching coach, right. and it definitely helped me make the next step into the professional ranks. And you went all four years at Florida? I was only there two years. Two years. I was there and two years. I got... was drafted okay. by the Reds and signed uh, right before spring training in 1981. And, you know, so I was telling somebody this the other day. My first two appearances in pro ball were one inning relief stints. And five days later, they hand me the ball and say, here, go nine innings. Really? Yeah. I mean, every, every starter was expected to go nine, wow. even back then. Wow. And it... it it worked out. Yeah, it worked out, yeah, and, and you know yeah. there was a certain amount of injury, and the yeah. team had to yeah. uh, juggle rosters. But most guys kept on through, made it past uh, you know a ball, and so it wasn't it wasn't like it was just this train wreck of arm injuries yeah. because we threw over 100 pitches every five days. How was it in the minor leagues back then? <laughs> the minor leagues. You, you see some ballparks and you visit some towns, and then you know, you've. It made me feel lucky that I grew up in South Florida. And, of course, the weather. I mean, when I got the, to Cedar Rapids, Iowa the first year, there was a foot of snow on the ground wow. in the middle of April. So we wow. didn't play for two weeks. Right. So now all the conditioning you did in Florida, you lost that. You, know, right. you can't uh, really make that up running around uh, a gym in, in the tundra of Iowa at that right. point. And then when you got called up, what was your first game? Wow, you are really digging deep I'm today. I'm digging deep. All right, so... W w the Reds were playing the Dodgers. We were losing 8-2, to two, and bullpen coach ran down and said, Murphy, you've got the top of the ninth. And, you know, it was a hot summer. Now, where is it, Cincinnati? In Cincinnati. In Cincinnati. And okay. I had warmed up a few times, but okay. had not gotten in. And, you know, the, that period of time was one of the greatest that, that I experienced in baseball because two days prior is when Pete Rose broke Ty Cobb's all-time right. hit record. So there's a lot of focus on Pete and all that. So right. I get down there, I throw my warm-up pitches, we make our outs in the bottom of the eighth, so I go in there pitch. I take my eight warm-up pitches. I'm walking around the mound while the infielders throw the ball around. And I actually took a look up, and, and I looked at the lights and the same. I said, well, you made it. 
Because as a kid, yeah. that's what you that's dream what you of, dream about. making it. All right, so now whatever happened beyond that, well, that was me versus all these hitters. Right. So uh, Mike Marshall uh, right. for the Dodgers, Dodgers, you know, the rookie yeah. of the year, good right. hitter. You know, I throw a fastball first pitch, and he fouls it off, and I uh, throw a fastball for a ball. Yeah. And I threw a hanging slider, and Mike hit it about 450 feet <laughs> wow. into the upper deck in Cincinnati. Yeah. So my mind really went to the fact yeah. was, which one of my teammates is going to say, welcome to the big leagues? Right. So right. that's all right. Pete Rose is the first baseman. He gets the ball, new ball from the umpire, right. and says, Murph, don't worry about it. You know, I made a bunch of outs at the beginning of my career, no problem. Yeah. So the next guy I walk on four straight pitches. And Pete's like, get us a ground ball, we'll get you a double play. Three pitches in the next at bat, ground ball to short. Concepcion flips it to Oster, throws it over Pete's head. But it hits the fence, so the runner stayed at first okay. base. Pete's got the ball, he comes back in, he said, hey, another ground ball, we're out of the inning. <laughs> Next pitch, ground ball to Oster, flips it to Concepcion, throws it over Pete's head. Pete comes back, he said, well, you're on your own, we're trying to mess you up. <laughs> so I got out of it, and, you know, I think I gave up about eight runs my next hundred innings. So oh, that was uh, it, great. It, it happened in a good thing, good way after now, that. How was it? to play for Pete Rose when he became your manager. It was great. He yeah. brought such intensity to the ball yeah. park, to the dugout, to, to the field. And, you know, at that point in time, you know, the, let's say in 1980, the next year, right. you know, the Mets were the top team in the, a, in the NL right. East and we were the top team in the West. And Pete would bring me in, all right, look, you're coming in to face Daryl Strawberry, you know, runner on third, one out. You cannot let the ball get out of the infield. And, and I just felt like, you know, my feet were, yeah. you know, two feet off the ground, and it's like, all right, I'm going to do it. And, and that's, that's the energy he brought. He made you perform better. He had a way of building you up. Without right, question. Right. It, it was his, great. And his knowledge of baseball was second to none. It was great. You could, yeah. you could just sit and listen, yeah. not even be part of his conversation. Right. But if you sat towards his end of the dugout, you would learn about things that you, you couldn't learn by reading every book ever written. On and he was one step ahead of the game all the time, right? A hundred percent of the that, time. That was good. And another one of our friends, Lenny Harris, <laughs> who played for Miami Jackson, played with you. Yep. And I know Lenny was nonstop talking. And there's a, another example of a Miami player. I mean, we could go through five shows and name all, yes. all the Miami players there. But that was a great experience. And, and, and now you're down coaching at high school, teaching. I, I don't like to use the word coaching as much as I use, I like to use teaching. Correct, I agree. Because I, I really believe, you know, when you're down on a high school level, you're not a coach, you're a teacher, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, anybody can coach, okay? I can make up a lineup, I got my lineup here, you're second, you're third, you got this average. But are you teaching? Is your student athlete gonna be a better person or better player today and better tomorrow? And you know what? We're at the end of our show as time goes by. But I want to thank you for, for coming out here today. My pleasure. And you make a quick prediction on the World Series. I got to pull for the Red Sox. You got to pull for That's the it. Red Sox. So and I'll get more condolences. Well, I want to thank everybody for watching our show. And here's another edition of Hey Coach.